it's been a really, uh, really a gift to go on this journey and to have so many of you come and then to have more watch online has been a really uh, great gift. You know, every week I try to make some kind of connection to when the church might show up. Remember the first responders, I said, well, I'm not usually on that list to call. You call the ambulance. And as you're riding in the ambulance, you say, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. Or our Father who art in heaven. And then maybe I'll meet you at the hospital. Other times, I'm right there when things are happening. With lawyers, I was like, I'm not really sure. Although I was telling Stephen the story that someone I went to visit who was in hospice care, he said, well, the funeral director was just here and the lawyer's coming next. So I'm not sure what it meant that I was in the middle of those two people. But uh, I'm really grateful for all the people that gather around us. And hasn't that been a theme, this whole thing? The people that come around us when we're in a time of need. And so we're gonna learn a whole different aspect of that tonight. So I'd like to start us with prayer, but I know that Stephen's faith is an important part of his practice as well. And so I think you'll hear that woven through. Accurate? Yes, we have good faith talks, we do. The Lord be with you. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for another night of learning and growth. We give thanks for all the people who gather around us uh, to offer us encouragement and support and their knowledge and wisdom when we are in a time of need, when we are uncertain, when things are chaotic. We are so grateful for all those who gather around us. Uh, most of all, we're grateful for your son because these people become his hands and his feet and his heart in the world. In his name we pray. Amen. All right. Here's your microphone. Thank you, Pastor Trudy. Um, so you may know that um, Pastor Trudy can be very humble. The, the first thing I thought of when she was in the middle between these two people was maybe a song some of you remember of uh, um, Clowns to the Left of Me, Jokers to the Right. <laughs> I, not claiming I know which one's the lawyer. But we, have, we haven't treated different ways at times. So thank you very much for uh, to coming to listen. I want to start out uh, um, with something that uh, um, came to mind as I was preparing for this. Um, a, a pastor I know very well, not Pastor Trudy, um, who's done many, many funeral memorial services, has a common theme in some of his sermons, and he begins with Ecclesiastes 3. And most of you know or will recognize that I wanted to um, start just by reading a couple verses from the beginning. And this is, I'm sure, will be very familiar to you. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. And as my pastor friend says, most of us are wondering what time it is. Seriously, when you think about that, what time is it? And in terms of a, a funeral, a memorial service for somebody we love, we're really mixed up. And, and really there is a time for weeping and mourning. mourning. There's a time for dancing and laughing as well. Um, and we're familiar with those pieces. If we back up in those verses, there's some other things of note, and I want to talk about those. So there's a time to plant and a time to pluck up. There's a time for planning, and that's the way I, I look at some of these verses. So uh, here's, here's my preparation, my big planning. I've got in one sheet for you. <clears throat> and easier for me, perhaps, is to put it out here. Um, and I, I'm sorry, I have a lectern, so I'll, I guess I'll use it for a moment. But as I say, there's a time to plant, to me that's a time to prepare. There's a time to break down and build up. That's a time to develop plans. And just speaking as a lawyer, I don't have people coming to me. I wish this were the case, but it isn't. I don't have people coming to me saying, I've had a wonderful year. I've had a fabulous year. Can I take maybe three hours of your time and pay you at your full rate just to tell you what a wonderful year it is? 
I don't know why you're laughing, but um, <clears throat> I mean, that's just not the way it goes. Uh, uh, people come to me usually because something has gone wrong. They're, they're worried or some terrible event has happened or is about to happen. And to a lot of my clients, things just feel out of control. Um, they've entered into a realm they're not familiar with, they're unaware of what to do, and they need some help. Planning happens in those times, as well as in times when there isn't any trouble. But there's always a time to break down where we're at. Something has gone wrong, or something will go wrong. So it's time to break that down, there's time to build up. And to me, that is planning. Um, there is a time to weep, there's a time to mourn. And this is part of who we are, we are created. There are wonderful things that happen in our lives, and one of the most wonderful is the relationships we're in with family and friends. We love deeply, and when we have a loss, we experience that in mourning and weeping. And if we don't have that, we've also lost out in something. And that needs to be recognized in whatever we're doing, even lawyers, we do this. And, and you have to have that as part of your experience as well. So we can't plan around those things as part of what happens. Um, a time to dance. Um, there is this time in life to, to laugh, to love, to enjoy God's great blessings. And that can be a lot easier to do if we don't have things hanging over us where we've forgotten to do or we're stuck in a bad place. And that happens often if we're not planning. So that's a little outline of the concerns I have and what I think I would be addressing for you. So when we talk here, and I say we talk, uh, please ask questions. It's okay, isn't it, to have a question at any point in time, um, right? Uh, and I'll, I'll do my best to answer. Um, you understand the lawyer's response is always, it depends. But um, I'll try to get beyond that if I can, can help you, all right? So, I thought we would talk about, since planning is a big part of this, right? Let's talk about what you can be doing. And I wanna talk about what you can do in preparation, but also what you do in response. Um, because there are a lot of things you're going to experience as a response. If you die, there's nothing left for you to do, correct? I'm just saying. Um, on, th on this side of the pale, there's nothing left. But those left behind have a lot to deal with. Sometimes you're gonna be the people left behind. In fact, there's only one time you won't be. So you're gonna to have to deal with some of these things if there isn't any planning or even if there is, and it'd be helpful to be familiar with some of that. Um, I wanna talk about the planning, estate planning issues. I wanna talk about probate or things that happen after someone, someone else dies. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about the cost of not planning uh, and what that might mean in, in your life and in the lives of those you love or leave behind or both. Um, and then hopefully we can talk a little bit about the, the blessing that you can have in your life, your family's lives if you're um, planning and in my view, if you are obedient. Um, because I, I think we are called as part of creation, we're called to be stewards of things God gives us. And that, I mean, it's, it's all of creation, which is overwhelming for us, and we can't do all that. But in our own families, we have a lot of control and a lot of responsibility. So, how does that sound? If, if you say no, I'm sorry. But, <laughs> <clears throat> uh, but really, questions at any time, okay? Some terms are, all of you have watched TV, so you know what a will is, right? Um, what they get wrong all the time on TV is that somehow the lawyer opens up the will and reads it and goes, oh, wow, I didn't know that. Well, <laughs> that better not be. The lawyer's typically written the will. Um, or it's something that has been filed off somewhere and it gets pulled out at the last second and shown to everyone and they're all surprised. Very bad things. But that, it doesn't make a good TV show if things go according to plan, right? So. That's not the way we do it. We draft wills 
for the benefit of the people writing them and their families. And we like to have that information out for everybody. So if you prepare a will and you want your assets or whatever it is that you are passing along to someone else, you kind of want them to know about that. And is it okay with them? Is it something that they want or can manage? If you want to give things to uh, uh, charities, if you want to give to the church, if you want to give to um, anyone other than family members, it's a very good idea for those family members to know it. Um, some of them just don't like that they don't get everything. And I think it's important for your children or grandchildren to know um, this is something that you are choosing and they need to accept this. If they don't accept it, you can talk about it. If they don't hear about it until after you're gone, there's no discussion. So some of these things really have to be brought out. Hiding is not a good deal in this kind of planning. Trusts. You've all heard of trusts, right? Um, anyone here think they want to tell me what a trust is? Yeah, good for you. I would never, <laughs> I would never volunteer that one. Yeah. Yeah, someone want to tell me what air is? Um, so trust can be many different things, but the whole concept is in a trust, there are beneficiaries to a trust, and there's a trustee who manages all the things that are within a trust, and then there are grantors to the trust. So anything that is in a trust, remember a trust is something that holds assets. It can be real property, which is usually what you might consider a home or a farm or a, a building or something like that. It's, it's, real property is attached to the earth. Part of the earth are attached to it. Or there's personal property, which is everything else under the sun. <coughs> Cash, clothing, cars, stocks and bonds, things like that would be personal property. So there are really only two categories. Trust will hold that. So if something will be named into a trust um, and it's placed there by a grantor. So you could be a grantor for a trust. And you could say, I'm gonna put into trust our family home. Okay, put that in the trust. Then there'll be a trustee within the trust. And in the state planning world, there are two basic trusts we deal with. One is called an irrevocable trust and another is called a revocable trust. Or for those of you who prefer English, one is a revocable trust and other is a non-revocable trust, okay? Um, so getting to the root of that, a revocable trust means you can what? Thank you. Yeah, some people say revoke, but yes, change, all right? So yeah, if it's a revocable trust, the grantor or grantors, whoever makes the trust can change it at any time in the lifetime once they have died, no, there's no change to be made. Irrevocable trust, a non-revocable trust, once it's created, cannot be changed. And there are legal reasons for having one over the other, but for the most part in estate planning, we're dealing with revocable, changeable trusts. So in the situation that we typically have in estate planning, you would be the grantor so you would own, say, your family home, or you and a spouse would own a family home. As a grantor, you would deed that home into the trust and say, well, then who manages it? Well, interestingly enough, when you create the trust, you name a trustee. And don't know about you, but um, who do you think you would trust more than anyone else in the world? If you name me, that's wonderful. But for most people, it's themselves, right? You, you know how you want to manage things. So you create a trust, you're the grantor, but you also name yourself as the trustee. So you put something in there and then you manage it during your lifetime. And then in the trust you say, on my death, um, there's gonna be a new trustee, what we call a successor trustee. And so you're gonna name someone else, typically a spouse or a child uh, you might name a, a trust company. Interesting how they get the name, isn't it? 
Um, so there will be trust companies or banks that will step in and do that. And the trust document continues on even after you've died. So the trust doesn't have a natural life. The trust exists for as long as you say it exists. So every trust has a starting date. And then within the trust, we say the trust continues on until this date or this event. And it could go on for generations even. Um, so within that trust, you're the grantor, you're the trustee, and you name a successor on your death. But you also will say at a certain point in time, the trust ends and the house and other assets are distributed in a certain way. And this is where the trust becomes like a will, because you've normally heard of a will and says, you know, I and my greatness and soundness of mind and body, and um, I say on my death that this goes to my son, this goes to my daughter, this, whatever you do, the same words are in a trust. And you say, on my death, I want you to distribute these things. Or after I die, it's held for a certain period of time. Or um, after I die, sell all these things, put the cash in an account, and when my children reach this age or that age, then give them access to those funds. Um, a lot of varieties in there of planning. That's the essence, I believe, of a trust. Is that making sense? See, yeah, fairly good response. That's good. Thank you. Um, it gets only complicated after that, and and there are many many ways we can do this. Um, one of the things that you've probably heard about is if you have a trust, then you can avoid probate. You guys heard about that? Um, and um, you might ask me, is that true? So someone throw that out at me. Is that true? <laughs> Funny you should ask. <laughs> it depends. Um, so then the, the answer is yes. You can avoid probate. Not yes, you will avoid probate. So what I've seen way too often is people will go through the exercise and create trusts, but they won't do what they need to do. So what I mean by that is um, if you say, um, I want to buy a house from you, and the seller says, fine, give me $500,000 and the house is yours. You give them $500, they walk out of the house and let you walk in. Is that house yours? Well, you might think it is, but what you really need is a deed from the seller. So is the house yours? Well, you're holding a deed. That's pretty good. But if they then sell it to another person the same day, and that person takes the deed they got and goes down to the county recorder's office and records it, guess whose house it is? So a trust is only worth what is in it. So if we create a trust, we have to actually fund it. So then if we put a house in, we have to deed the house from you to you as trustee of that trust. And then it is in the trust. And then it is subject to the trust. So unfortunately, I've seen too many people too late. And I've, now I've only had two in my office in the past week um, with this problem. And it's really unfortunate. And it happens. Um, so when the trust is created, it has to be funded to have value. If you don't fund it, you might end up probating and the trust not having a whole lot of value to you. Um, I will tell you, if the trust is there, there's also a will. So trusts don't replace wills. There are provisions in wills that are transferred into trusts for a lot of benefits like we talked about, but we'll still create a will what we call a pour-over will. Um, so, um, I don't know. Um, I'm not going to do this. Okay? Right? I'll take a drink. Um, so, we have a baptistry, right? Yeah. I'm not going to do this. Um, so, we call these wills pour-over wills. Let's see if you're getting the concept. So, this font 
would be the trust. And the will says, anything that I own that isn't in the trust on my death goes into the trust. So I would pour over this water would go into the font. Does that make sense? Um, I didn't do it. Uh, yeah, it's, I'm kind of proud of myself. Um, so what would happen in the situation where the trust is not funded, we're going to have to probate. And then when we finish probate, guess what's happening? Everything goes into the trust. And then we have to manage the trust after that. And in that situation, you might as well not have had the trust in the first place because um, you spend a little bit of money to create the trust. It, it might still work out. It might be beneficial um, if you have beneficiaries who are minors, meaning not yet 18. It still could be good because we'll have provisions in the trust in case there are beneficiaries who are underage. But what we want to do is fund that trust so that we don't run into this problem of having to probate. There's always going to be something. Yes, yeah, sorry. What is the probate process? Gee, I should have hit that sooner. Um, good question. Oh, so, yeah, sorry. The question is, so what is probate anyway? Is that a fair restatement? I left out the... Uh, why didn't you tell us what probate was in the first place? So, uh, okay, very good idea. Probate. Um, the state has a real interest in knowing who owns what, particularly real estate. And that's why we have a recorder of deeds and all those other things. It isn't very helpful if the recorder's office lists all these owners of property and we find out that the owners have died. Well, then who owns the property now? Because I will tell you, it's very difficult for a dead person to own anything on this earth. It's very hard to transfer, right? I mean, you need to sign something to transfer it. On top of that, you need a notary who says, I saw him sign it. Uh, so there are real challenges. So the state has a vested interest in managing things civilly. How do we know where that property belongs? So that's why the state, Illinois says, when somebody dies, if they own any property in this state, no matter its value, their estate has to be probated. Okay, I'm not using the definition of probate and probate. Don't worry, I'm getting there. But so probate, there's a special court in Kane County, and it's our probate court. And in there, we probate. I'm just getting under your skin by saying this same word all the time. Um, the notion is the court says in the end, who will own this property that once owned to the person, belonged to the person who died? So who will be the new owner? And what is going to guide the court in that process? The best guide for the court is a will. Where the, the person who's died says, Everything I own goes here, or these things go there, whatever, they lay it out. If they have forgotten to name something, any goodwill should say, and everything else goes here. Um, so at that point, uh, the probate judge is going to issue an order that says, here's where everything goes. They're also going to name an executor, or an administrator in the court's terms, who is going to make those things happen and then report back to the court that it has happened. So that way, that person has letters of office, they're called, from the Kane County courts saying, this person has the authority to act for the deceased. So that is how things happen, and that's what probate is for. And it's really for real estate. That's the, the state's biggest concern, what happens to all the real estate. Well, the powers were expanded so that the court can rule on anything and everything owned by the decedent, the person who died. And anymore, for most people, the single largest asset we have these days isn't the home, the ancestral manse, or the farm, or whatever. What is it? For most people, 
Can you, can you guess the single largest asset most people have now? Yeah, retirement accounts, 401k, IRA. Um, if, just to set aside, if managed properly, those things never end up in probate because you can name beneficiaries and, and goodness. If we, get, if we get there to that level, I want to explain why that's the way we would go and hopefully never have those things probated. But you might own other things outside of that. If you have a brokerage account, if you own a second home um, out of state, or if you own shares in a company, um, or the family owns something together, you have a little portion of it, all those things would have to be probated. So is that a, a fair concept then of what, what is probate and why do we do it? So why do we want to, oh, yes. Okay, so, yeah, my question is, let's see if I can get this maybe in a couple fewer words, right? Um, so everything, everything goes through probate. Is that a fair restatement of the question? That's a great question because um, the answer is, it depends, right? <clears throat> um, better answer, yes, but or yes explanation. Um, so what gets probated? Everything that is owned by the person who died. And when I say owned by the person who died, I mean owned individually in that person's sole name. So how do you, how do most people, who here owns a, a home, a, a condo or a, um, okay, every, everybody has it. How do you own your home. Do you know? Okay, you're saying the two of us, right? What do you mean? Jointly. Okay, what do you mean jointly? Do you mean joint with right of survivorship, which is how most people try to do it, or um, another great legal fiction in the state of Illinois, what we call tenancy by the entirety, meant for married couples in your primary residence? Sorry, we don't have time to explain that one. <laughs> But uh, I would love to, but that's what lawyers do. So if you own it jointly um, with a right of survivorship, what that means is if one of you dies, the survivor owns all of it immediately. So the person who died doesn't own it any longer, has no right to it at all because the person has died. So that is not property that would go through probate. So getting back to our 401k or IRA situation, when you open one up, whoever's the custodian for the accounts, so Fidelity or uh, whomever um, is the custodian, will have you sign a document saying, who is your beneficiary? So you have to name a beneficiary when you do that. They won't open an account if you don't. And that's a contract between you as the owner of the funds and Fidelity, Schwab, whomever as the custodian, it's a contractual relationship. And the custodian is then responsible on your death to fulfill your statement about who receives it. So as soon as you die, you are no longer the owner of that account. It goes direct to a beneficiary. So is that part of what goes to probate? No. Um, if you, for some reason, leave it blank, or every beneficiary you name has died, um, or you actually write in for some unknowable reason, I am the beneficiary or my estate is a beneficiary, then it goes into probate. But that's the only way. Okay, how, how am I doing on that part of it? How am I doing on the time part of it? Wow. <laughs> okay, is it time to apologize? <laughs> I, I am sorry. Um, you've been exceptionally patient, uh, either that or sleeping. So in probate, everything that the person who died owned 
individually. And there are a lot of things that get excluded, thankfully. So how do we know if we have to probate? The law says you have to probate. I already said if there's real estate. And even if the real estate is worthless or underwater, and I've had this experience where somebody owned a piece of property, put it into a reverse mortgage. Okay, you like Tom Selleck, you've heard about reverse mortgages, right? Um, it can be a great deal, but, um, and it was for this man. He, he got a lump sum and he lived in this house, but by the time he died, um, the house had a, a value that was less than the amount owed to the bank who took the, the reverse mortgage. And, and that's not a problem. I mean, the, the family just says, okay, you take the home. We're not, we don't have to pay back the loan, and you take the home. However, the home was still in this person's name. So what does that mean? We had to probate. And his estate was really underwater. So his children had to pay to deal with the state. I mean, he had a car and a couple other things they were able to sell. Um, I, uh, I took quite a hit to fees to make sure that, you know, the children weren't just throwing money in. But it was very unfortunate because title was in his name. We had to probate. If it had been in the, a trust, wouldn't have had to probate. Because it wouldn't have been in his name, it would have been in the name of the trust. Even if he's trustee, he would not have been the personal owner. So um, that's one way we probate. The other um, indicator for probate is when the, the decedent, the person who's died, had ownership of $100,000 of value in the aggregate. So whatever personal property, real estate, everything put together, if it reaches $100,000 in total value, we have to probate. Um, you own two Cadillacs, we have to probate. So you have to be careful about what's out there. And if we're planning to avoid probate for costs and convenience, then we need to manage those assets pretty well, make sure how they're owned is correct. And avoiding probate can be nice. Um, probate has a surety to it, because you go in and the judge says, you know, this is the way it is, and bam, the gavel hits. Not too often, but we'll pretend it does. And the judge signs the final order and this is done. And if anyone had a claim against the estate and they didn't bring it up in the right time period, it's over. No more claims can be made. Um, a trust doesn't give you that level of protection. So the, the probate is nice for that. Um, but it takes time. Uh, I have had in, you know, whatever, 30 some years of doing this, one estate I can recall where we opened it and closed it in the same calendar year. Now that doesn't mean it always takes a year, but there's a built-in six month waiting period where you can't do anything except wait to see if someone's gonna make a claim against the estate. So that, that's a delay that we like to avoid. Probate costs money, um, not outrageous, but it costs money. Okay, phew. So that's topic one. Uh, so now I, we've talked about um, wills, we've talked about estates, we've talked about probate, it's a confluence of those. Uh, another question I think that you might have, this might be fair, you've heard about estate taxes. Um, it probably isn't a large worry for most of you. Um, the world has changed. When I was first uh, practicing, when I'm young now, but I, I actually was younger. And so 30 years ago, um, if you, on your death, you owned assets of $600,000 or more, you had to pay an estate tax to the federal government. Well, okay, your estate had to pay the estate tax to the federal government. Now, that's more than 11 million. Um, and also, um, that's transferable to a surviving spouse. So, 
if you don't have 11 million, but you die and 20 years later your spouse dies and there's 25 million in there, like, oh my goodness, you have to pay taxes on everything above the 11 million? Well, no, uh, you would double that 11 something, so your taxes would only be on the amount above. And how many of you have a net worth of 25 million or more? Right, so see, this really isn't a concern for most people anymore on the federal level. On the state level, it's $4 million. It starts getting closer to people you know, um, if not you. Um, what's different at the state level, there's not a transferability to a surviving spouse. So if the first dies and you don't manage to set money aside to avoid the state taxes, and then the second one dies and there's more than $4 million in net worth, then you have to pay a state tax. And the federal level, you can double it and the surviving spouse takes advantage. State level, we don't. Um, and there is concern that those levels are gonna go down. Believe it or not, the, the state of Illinois is looking for money. Uh, the federal government's looking for money. So there's a concern that those exemption levels are gonna come down in the future. So truly, um, my clients are not in the $25 million world of big concern. Um, but that's fine. If they came in and said it, I'd tell them to go to uh, someone who specializes in those giant estates and they can pay the lawyer's fee of $50,000 to talk. That, that's not what I do. That's not where most of us are living. So we have to make plans. Estate taxes are usually not a big deal, but there are some situations where that comes up. And especially if you're in, a, you're in a situation where there's going to be a generational transfer. So perhaps you have um, parents, aunts and uncles who um, have been great at saving money um, and it's gonna end up in your lap. That might be enough to push you into a different category. So there has to be some thought about that. When you go to estate planning, you have to tell a lawyer, well, here's my estate, it's really not that big, I'm not too worried about this. Um, well, my parents die, I'm gonna get $5 million. Whoa, okay, changes everything, and your planning has to account for that. Um, the estate planning tax is also associated with gift tax. Have you ever heard of gift tax? Okay, so you have this lifetime exclusion, that's the 11 million mark. You can give money away and be taxed on it. If you give anything of value to somebody and that the person who receives it is getting $17,000 or more, you as the giver have to pay a tax to the federal government. So we counter this by planning gifting out in a state work so that you never give any single person more than $17,000 in a single year. You can give them $17,000 on December 31st and 17 on January 1st, no problem. But you then have to wait a whole other year before giving again. Real brief hit on that one, but I, I want you to be aware of that if you're gonna be making any planning. A gift to anybody in the world. There's, well I shouldn't say that, a gift to anybody in the world who isn't your spouse. Pardon me? Right, any, a, a wedding gift, yes. Uh, any gift that has value in excess of $17,000 is taxable to you. Now, there's a great out here because that lifetime exclusion, the 11 million, that's a state and gift tax. So you can report on your taxes. Let's say you made a gift to somebody, very generous wedding gift of $25,000 of value. Just report it on your taxes and agree that you're gonna reduce your lifetime exemption by $25,000. So instead of a 11 and a half million, it's 11, four and, you know, understand? It's not gonna affect you in any way. But if you don't report it and it's found out, no matter what, you're gonna to have to pay tax on that. So it's, a, it's an easy one to deal with, with any kind of uh, tax accountant, any tax preparer will be ready for that. Just say, I, I made a gift this year. Um, let's take it against my lifetime exemption. So recipient of the gift 
So does the recipient of the gift pay any tax? Um, what would you think would be fair? <laughs> right, yeah. N no, they don't have to pay a thing. It's the giver that gets hit with a tax. No, no. Well, it's not income, it's a gift. Yeah, so uh, yeah, a gift, a gift is not going to be taxable on the receiving end, but on the sending end it can be. Um, man, you know what you've reminded me of, Pastor Trudy? I can't yeah. Um, so asking is paying for a wedding a gift. There's something I should have said early on. Um, lawyers always answer with it depends, right? right? Let me start with I'm not a tax attorney. <laughs> um, I am not an accountant. I'm not a CPA. Um, yeah, I refuse to answer the question because I can't. Uh, I, um, I will say it, it may depend on really what is, what's received for it. There, you may be paying something of value for yourself, which is not a taxable event. If you wanna say, I spent all this money just for my child, and you want to subject yourself to taxes, go ahead. If you want to say, I spent all this money because my bride would be mad at me if I didn't. You, because you can give, I said, you have, you're, you're subject to this gift tax to anybody in the world you give to, not if you're married. If you give to a spouse, you can give any amount at any time in any year. Um, I'm sorry if that's gonna create internal strife in a marriage, <laughs> but it's true. So you can give to a spouse any amount, not taxable, any time. Okay, so I, I'm, how am I doing on time now? Okay, oof. All right, so I, I think those are the main categories I've covered. I, I want to talk about uh, the, the planning and preparing. That, that was the breaking down and building up um, and the, the planting. Let, let's talk a little bit about the, maybe the, the reaping of it. Okay, this is a part that has real value. Um, we are called to be stewards. Um, we have this creator's given everything to us, but calls us to account. We're responsible for it. And not responsible to hoard it, but responsible to do what's right with it. And um, that might be passing it along to family, it might be giving it to friends, it might be giving it to people in need. Doing nothing is not exactly being responsible. The state is willing to step in and, and tell you and your family what happens. And if you're not aware of this, um, that's okay, not everyone is. Um, my first year of law school, I took a course in uh, property law. Well, that covered a lot of basics, including this stuff. Um, my level of interest in this stuff was pretty low. And, and I loved my property professor. Um, he knew exactly where I sat, and he had a chart, and we had to sit in these places. And I think he had a little problem with his vision and mobility. I sat next to um, a, a young man named Wallace. Great name for a lawyer, right? He's a law professor now, wonderful guy. Lawless and Lemon. So we sat next to each other that entire term. We got called on all the time. And we were just right in his line of sight and he called us. This is what happens at law school. The bell rings and the professor says, Mr. Lemon. So you stand up and you're just shaking. Explain to me, and he names a case. And then at that point you have to explain the whole case, give what it was, what the ruling was and why, all the basis for it. And it's a terrifying moment, typically. Um, I got called on all the time and, and Lawless and I got called on all the time and it was going on and on and on. 
I said, you know, this section came up on who gets what if there's no planning. I said, you know, it's, it's in a statute. I don't even really have to know this. I think I'm going to read a book. And I mean a, like a good book, not a law book. And I just shut that thing down. And the next morning I go in, Mr. Lemon. And he says, so George dies. Um, and here are all the relatives in George's family. Tell me who gets how much. Well, I can be silent now. I wasn't silent then. I just opened up my mouth and I, I made something up on the spot. And the law professor just stopped. He looked at me and said, Mr. Lemon, you're a squirrel hunting up the wrong hill. And um, thankfully, he had a little grace for me because I'd answered well. But um, it, there was no planning on my part. But the state is willing to step in. And the state will tell you what happens. If you die and you are married, your surviving spouse will get something. Do you think your surviving spouse gets everything? No. Not if you leave children, your children get half. If you have one child, one child gets half, surviving spouse gets half. If you have 12 children, the 12 share one half and the spouse gets one half. You might like that plan or you might not. Um, if you are not married and you have no children, what happens? No, no, it doesn't go to the state. The, the state will try to keep it in the family. It'll go to your parents. What if your parents aren't living? Uh, well, it'll go to your siblings. What if your siblings aren't living? Well, it's just, um, this is where lawyers really get kind of giddy because there's a lot of work we can do to figure that out. But it's not worth it. Have a plan and know where things go. No one is going to say, you were a member of Geneva Lutheran, you want something to go to Geneva. No, uh -uh. that's not part of it. It only goes to family. If there are no descendants, and, and there's a long degree out there, if there are no descendants, then it goes to the state. I've yet to find someone where everything goes to the state. But um, it'll go to somebody you have never heard of, some distant relative of yours, uh, and it happens. So not a good idea to go without planning. So... Okay, um, some of the fruit of it, you have made a plan, your children or other family know what the plan is, um, you're not going to be worried about this aspect of things, it's taken care of, there's not going to be commotion within the family, somebody trying to decide, well, what did mom want, what did dad want, I know, they told me, and this is this is one in my office from two weeks ago, where mom came in, son came in, and daughter came in. Son knew that the family business was going to him. Mom didn't share the same idea. Um, it's a crisis. And, and not because I can't tell what's going to happen. I, I tell him, I, here's what's going to happen. That doesn't change anything within the family dynamic. It's very unfortunate. And all it took was for dad to say to son and to daughter, here's the way it goes. Like it or not, this is what I'm doing. It didn't happen. Um, so very unfortunate and it, it creates a mess. And, and there isn't a fruitfulness about it. There's not, there's not a whole lot of dancing in that, right? And, and I think that we, we should have that time set aside for our families. So they weep and they mourn, but they should dance and they should laugh too. And this is a, it's a scar to leave and it's not an appropriate thing um, to avoid this kind of planning. Okay. I'm sure I've gone way over. So uh, any, any more questions? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a, well, a transfer on death. Remember how he said when you have an IRA or 401k, there's a contract and a beneficiary? A transfer on death is 
very much the same thing. You are putting in essentially contractual relationship. And um, so you're saying, on my death, this person receives this property. It's, you use it for a specific account or a specific real estate. It's not a you know, generic overall thing. You name specific items in it and you say, on my death, the new owner will be. What, and what does that do? Just like um, in the 401k or the a joint tenancy with real estate, as soon as you've died, that's no longer in your state. It immediately transfers. So it's not subject to the probate rules and it, um, we don't have to worry about probating those items. So there, there's some good uses for it. There's some dangers with it because there's some real concern that when you've done that, the person you have named now feels like they have a solid benefit and that it's contingent on death. But since we know everybody is going to die, I, I mean, we're, we've been teaching this, right? I mean, chances of death are still, yeah, they're still pretty good. So uh, I, I use that a lot because some clients are just too shaken up. And I say, you know, the chances of your dying are still better than 99.9%. .9%. And some say, oh, what do you know? <laughs> okay. It's, yeah. I, don't call me Isaiah or something. I, I'm just saying you're going to die. So because we know we're going to die, we sign this. There are people who are trying to say that that beneficiary now has a real interest that isn't actually contingent. So can you change that document? Can you take that away from them? <sighs> so I, I get a little concerned about that. So I only want to use a transfer on death when the person signing it knows this is exactly what I want to have. I'm not going to change my mind. Or if I change my mind, I know this person I'm naming will understand why. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, a trust can do it without the restrictions. Yep. Yeah, because you can change the terms of the trust anytime you want to. You can change the terms of a will anytime you want to as well. You just have to recreate. So I would say that, um, well, the biggest risk is that you aren't going to fund it. We talked about that. Okay, but let's say you do everything correctly. Um, you create it correctly, you fund it correctly, um, and you die and the distribution starts happening. Somebody says, this is not right. Um, so, for instance, compare it to probate. Um, if you have a will, and you say in your will, um, I'm, I'm married to my lovely wife, Sue. Um, the 25 years of our marriage are reward enough for her. Um, and so everything I have is going to the protection of emperor penguins. Well, Sue might disagree with a number of things about this, right? So, um, she can go into the into probate because it's open before the judge and say, this is ridiculous, judge. And the judge will say, yeah, well, he gets to do what he wants to do. Um, she can say, I don't care. I have a right under the law to reject that will and take a share that's appropriate. And the judge can go with a, a statutory share or something else and say, no, this isn't correct. Or um, there's a listing that says my children are um, John and Stephanie um, but the will was written 30 years ago and after Stephanie came Laura and Bob and but they're not listed so do they get anything oh okay so those younger children are gonna have a claim and they're gonna come and make it if that happens in a trust they don't have that open vehicle of the probate put in front of them where they can just walk into court and say I've got an issue here judge they have to initiate their own litigation and they can do it at about any time. So we don't have that certainty of the six month period of making a claim and then closing it with the end of the estate. So that's the biggest concern. Does it happen? Yes. Very often, no. Um, 
again, you do the planning correctly, you do it wisely, we're not gonna run into this trouble. You, but you can never tell what people are gonna do. So um, probate gives you that certainty. Trust don't, but again, good planning, prudent planning, and having everybody aware of it uh, knocks down those chances of something going wrong. And we've never experienced anything together where things have gone wrong in the planning. So, um, yeah. <laughs> um, really, I, I, I'm sorry. I thought we would have most of our time on question and answer here, and I could tell war story after war story, but... Um, Well, as between you and me, that's wonderful. The other people who might want to go to sleep in their own beds instead of here, but let's. Um, I mean, I, <laughs> un, unbelieved, unbelieved. So. Um, um, there are a lot of different trusts. What I'm talking about in estate planning purposes, though, for the most part, are just basic, um, self-created, self-directed, revocable trusts. Um, there are, um, there's a whole series of irrevocable, non-revocable trusts. Um, there are trusts that get created by statute. There are trusts that get created just by law under weird circumstances. Um, most of those are not going to concern you unless you have some high stakes ownership in um, real estate businesses um, uh, or you have other contingent um, rights. So um, I don't want to get too excitable out there, but uh, and and this does happen, and I've experienced it a couple times in the past year. Um, one remarkable one where um, there was a, a lovely family, um, I just great couple, two young, um, well, no longer young boys, but men um, serving in the Navy and Coast Guard. Um, father retired, um, and he did great planning, and so he said, we're retired, and we're all going to meet in Hawaii for a vacation for a couple of weeks. And to the kids, you know, come when you can. And, and it was a great time. Um, right before this, his mother died suddenly in Florida. It's a lot of heartache there. Um, and mom said, you know, and I'm gonna give this to my son. And, um, and he said, oh boy, well, we have this vacation. Let's go do that. Then we'll finish up mom's estate. They go to Hawaii. All of a sudden, he's got a little problem with his vision. Um, he goes into uh, the hospital there. It's, uh, they're saying, well, the um, optic nerve is separating and better take care of it here. Flying home, it, it could totally separate and then you'll lose sight in your eye. Not a big deal, a little um, surgery. He died, just suddenly. And in mom's estate, which is pretty significant, says to my son, all these different things, using very standard language, if he survives me by 30 days. Wow, he didn't. And um, sometimes when you draw up wills or trust for people, um, and I, I put these in mind, I have language in there that says, um, that the, the surviving, um, exe the executor, the trustee, has the power to control those gifts that aren't yet received. It's a, called a power of appointment among lawyers. And, but the only way to exercise that is to know what, where the gift might be coming from. So if he had known about this, we could have written into his will that says, um, there's a power of appointment for gifts from my mother. If he'd done that, no problem. But he didn't, and, and, you know, these things happen. Um, so we can't, can't take care of everything. Um, but I will tell you, if you go to um, uh, cheapwills.com, you're probably not gonna get 
all those things. Uh, there's a certain lack of interview questioning going on. But yeah, we plan for what we can plan for, but there are problems. I didn't repeat the question. What kind of paperwork do you need to appoint an executor? Yeah. A will. In the, in the will you say, I, I name this person as my executor. In the, trust, in the trust you say, I name this person as the successor trustee. Yeah, same concept. And, right, and, and in there we'll say, we'll, we'll list a series usually. You know, one, two, three people in order. Um, and if they're unable or unwilling to serve, then it moves to the next one down. Yeah. Can you make them co-executors? Yes. Okay, yeah, two questions. Can you make them co-executors? Is it a good idea? John, you and I are gonna be talking about this one, I, I think. Um, yes, you can make people co-executors. You can have one, two, three. If you're really silly about it, you can have more. I think two is being silly about it. There are certain circumstances when it's right, but if you have co-executors, that means that the two people have to participate in every event. So if you're selling something off, they both have to sign off on it. And if it requires uh, witnesses and notary, they both have to be in the same room at the same time. And if you have, I, I have a, a child in Atlanta and a child in Portland, yeah, um, not gonna work, right? So. Um, I prefer if we can narrow it down to one executor and put in the order. There are circumstances when people say, that's just not gonna work, they both have to be on there. And we'll go with that, but they have to know what it means. Yes? So maybe in the second or third tier of uh, documents, uh, Um, do we have prizes? We don't have prizes. I'm sorry. What's what's your name? Don. You, you just you won the prize and you bested me entirely. Um, so the question is: Is there a second or third tier of documents, like powers of attorney? Um, I, I forgot to mention here at the outset when when I do estate planning for people, I tell them there's one document more important than any other and it's the power of attorney for healthcare. Um, so even if you forget to do a will, at least the state will back it up and say, well, here's how it goes and it'll end up in your family. It might not be the right thing to do, but at least that'll happen. If you don't have a power of attorney for healthcare executed, there's nobody who can do anything for you in making healthcare decisions without a court order. And that's, not gonna be good and there's not time for that and um, it creates all sorts of havoc and problems and you will use a power of attorney for healthcare. Uh, any guesses here on how often a will gets used? Once, right, once. A trust gets used all the time, a will gets used one time. Yeah, the question is, can you layer who has that power uh, in a power of attorney for healthcare? Um, yes, you can name each other. You can name your children after that. Um, we do it in order. Um, we don't do, um, we don't share that power of attorney. Um, so um, we can share a power of attorney for property under certain conditions. So and that's a separate document we would do as a power of attorney for property. Um, first of all, there's a, um, a statutory restriction when you're using a st the short form statutory form for power of attorney against using um, two people in that, both having the power. Um, if we go outside of that and write our own, we can create that. But when there's a statutory form, meaning the, the General Assembly, state legislature in Illinois says, if you use this form, everyone in the state has to accept it. So we can create something outside of those forms 
um, and someone may accept it or may not, and if they don't, you gotta take them to court and have a judge review it and say, yep, that works. Well, by then it's really kind of too late. So that, that's why there's a restriction on it. So a follow-up question then. Um, I'm frequently asked when I go into the doctor, do you have to do it? Are you? Okay, so you, question, you're, you're, so going into the doctor, you're frequently asked, do you have a living will? And I don't. And um, I thought, oh, I, I, so now I, I omitted this in, in our planning, and then uh, some internet sources suggest, well, you know, that's really not a very good idea for most people. Uh, do you have an opinion on that? Could you, you know, fill this out? Sure. So the question is, um, after doing some internet research, it looks like living will might not always be a, a great thing. And do I have an opinion on it? Well, more than that, do I have an opinion I'm willing to share, right? Sure. Yeah. You're really out for prizes tonight, Don. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think a living will is the greatest of ideas. But a living will, all it is is a statement of what you would like to see done. A statement of your intent. It's not really an enforceable document, but it's letting people know what you would like. And um, if you want something that's an enforceable document, you have the power of attorney for health care, and that addresses some very specific situations. It's mainly the power of attorney for health care is um, you're saying that this other person, not me, can make decisions for me about my health care. Uh, under certain circumstances, and that you're giving guidance on what those are. There are really only two main questions in the statutory short form power of attorney for health care. Um, one is um, you have to choose between these two. I want this to be effective immediately so that this person can make decisions for me right now, um, or the alternative is this person can make choices for me only when I can't make them for myself. And so people read that and go, oh, well, yeah, I want it to be when I can't make it for myself. And I go back then and say, but in that first one it says, this person can make decisions for me right now, comma. But if I'm able to and want to, I can make a decision for myself. So I say when Sue um, who hasn't yet lost her husband, doesn't know that she's going to get nothing because it goes to the penguins. Um, if she's given the power and she finds out about the penguins and she goes in the doctor and says, yeah, take the leg off, right? Um, and he says, wait a minute, no, keep the leg. She said, you gave me the power. He says, yeah, but I still got a mind and no, I want to keep the leg. The doctor's going to keep the leg, right? So you're not giving everything away. Um, so th that's, that's one question. The other one is, um, you, you're agreeing with one statement or the other. The first statement is, um, my life is really important to me. Keep me alive no matter what, no matter what the cost or the time or the likelihood of my ever coming out of this condition I'm in. And the condition is that you're basically non-responsive. The second option is quality of life is more important to me than quantity of life. And if a doctor says my chances of coming out of this and, and living um, a life where I can have loving relationships and interact with people, don't give me any care. Just keep me comfortable. Keep me from pain. So they're diametrically opposed. But those are the guidelines in the statutory form. And then you give some person the power to make those decisions for you. Um, so, yes? How does that interact with the DNR? Okay, so how does the power of attorney for healthcare interact with the DNR? Um, DNR meaning do not resuscitate order, right? Um, the do not resuscitate order is a direct order from you to your healthcare provider. So um, that is going to, it's going to take precedence in the eye of the healthcare provider um, 
However, if there's a valid power of attorney for health care and the power of attorney for health care says, keep me alive no matter what the cost, and the one holding that power of attorney says, do not prevent him from having a ventilator, keep him going, then the health care provider is in a deep quandary. And what do you think they're going to do? They're probably going to keep you going. So, yeah, it's a hard, hard thing. So you need to coordinate those. And I know that's part of your question is how do they relate? Um, so, and uh, do not resuscitate orders typically are given at a hospital or a doctor's office at a particular time and not an overarching thing. We can write them as an overarching thing, but then you're going to have to carry it with you all the time. And the healthcare provider is going to have to know this really is your intent. So when you do it at a facility, so if you go in for some type of procedure and you want to execute a do not resuscitate order, they will accept it if they're in a, um, um, uh, what, um, a hospital with a certain level of trauma care, I forget what it is. So if you go for like an outpatient surgery center, or an ambulatory care place, they're not gonna accept a DNR. And if you say, well, I have to have one, they'll say, well, thank you for coming, but go home. They're not going to treat you. And go ahead, ask me how I know, but at another time. Uh, so I, 10 years ago, I thought I'd seen everything. And 20 years ago, I knew I'd seen everything. And right? um, Today, I, I know there's a lot I haven't seen yet, but wow, I've seen quite a variety of things. Yes. Yes. Yep. Um, so the question, yeah, to to do jointly held assets need to be retitled to go into a trust. Anything and everything that goes into a trust has to be titled into the trust. Doesn't matter how it's held beforehand. The owner, when it goes into a trust, the owner has to be the the trust. It can be the specific trustee named, um, or it can just be titled to the trust. Um, in Illinois, the way we typically do for real estate, we would name the trustee. Um, okay, so um, it, it would say in there, um, for me, um, if I own my house in my name, I put it into a trust in my name. I would create a deed that said, from Stephen Lemon, to Stephen Lemon as trustee under the Stephen Lemon Trust, dated whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah. Hopefully, you're not. The question is, and the lawyer does that when you meet with them for hours and hours. Um, that, not because we've been here for hours and hours, but because you see, it could take some. Time, yes, it, the lawyer should take care of all that for you. Um, but again, don't just assume everything's gonna go the way you want it. Speak up and give the, give the lawyer as much information as the lawyer can handle. Um, so if you're concerned about something, just ask. Okay, so something I, um, I tell my clients, and a lot of lawyers will do this too, um, when you come in and, and make some plans out, I want to get something done for you. And there can be so many questions. And well, what if we do it this way? What if we do it that way? And I'm so worried if I choose it this way and I decide later, <sighs> I'll have goofed. I say, okay, I, I get that. Let's create the document. And then we'll take one year with it. And, and if you think, no, we should have done it differently, come back, we will change it. We'll make it that way, and it's part of the cost of doing this. So we, we want to get it done, and we want you to be able, feel comfortable with it. You come back in 18 months, I'll say, it's wonderful to see you again, and you'll get a new invoice, right? But, you know, we, we want to get things going, so um, we do that. We'll try and get it down on paper, and then say, if you have questions, if you want to change it, Come on in. 
I, I just don't want someone to say, if I call, I'm gonna get another bill for a 20 minute call and I'm not gonna do it then. And then we just haven't made these things that were important to us, right? We haven't made the right plan. We, we haven't done it the way we should. You haven't and I haven't. Yeah, and, th and that's, um, you might think I'm the only lawyer that does it that way because I'm super. I mean, this is what we want to have done. I mean, you're gonna find that from, from people who care to do this right for you. Is that good? Uh, is the, isn't this they the keep, party? This is the party. They keep asking questions after. So I want to thank you. You've been very generous with your time. Do you have something to wrap up? No, I just wanted you to see the extent of my um, outline. Is that? It's only this long. Yeah. That was a lot of talking for that long. Yeah. <laughs> you did a good job. Super generous with your time. And not just tonight. You've been generous to the church with some time as well. And so, anyway, but when we came, my husband and I are doing our planning with you, and he gave us a packet to work through. Have all of you done this? We'll be done next year, I think. It's a lot of work to do this, but it's worth it, is what I heard the overarching theme tonight. Not making it personal here, but so there's this estate planning questionnaire that we have that you're talking about, and fill all this out. And, and I do tell people, if you don't want to answer everything, that's fine, we'll talk about it. But, but I need you to look at this, and then we'll come in and we'll go through it with you. And if you don't want to give me some of those answers, you think they're too private, we'll talk about why I am asking for them. And if you don't want to give it, that's fine, but I'll let you know what you might lose by not sharing it. Um, I, just this week, <sighs> um, so Monday I had a new client come in, and she was diligently filling out this estate planning questionnaire as I was diligently not coming to spend time with her. Um, but I came down, she had just kind of finished some things and I said, great, let's go over it. And I looked through it and the bottom of the first page, there's a question that says, um, have either you or your spouse been married before? And I said, oh, you didn't answer this. She said, yeah, I, I wasn't sure. <laughs> So I'm trying to process that one. And I said, okay, um, so what's the concern? Well, what do you mean? So either, oh, do you mean either one of us has been married before? Yes, yes, that's it. Oh, okay. So this is, I mean, I'm playing the dentist right now. I'm like I'm pulling the teeth out of this woman. I said, yes, so... Um, now she's a widow, you know, was your husband married before? No. So you were married before? Yes. I said, I noticed on here, you put your maiden name. Um, did you mean that that was your prior husband's name? No, no, that was my maiden name. I'm like, well, it's the same as your son's name. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I wasn't married when he was born. Oh, okay. But you were married after that? Yes. Okay. So what was your husband's name? What, um, when you got married after that, what was your husband's name? Oh, William. <laughs> I said, okay, can you give me his name and maybe the when you were married? Yeah. And when did he die? Oh, I don't know. No, I, I divorced him. Oh, okay. But you're... Oh, yeah, well, I married again. Okay, so what was his name? William. Okay, whole name. When were we married? And, and, oh, yeah, I divorced him. Oh, so then you're married again. Yes, yes. And his name was John. Okay, and I was married and, and he died. Oh, I don't know, um, but I divorced him. So... Your next one, married William. So this just <laughs> and she gives me the dates. I mean, no, those are the dates of the prior guy. Oh, yeah. Um, no, that's where he got married him, and then and then he died. I said, "Wow, okay." And 
I'm like, and children with any of this? No. Whew, wow. No children. Um, and then she looked at me and said, yeah, if I meet a, name, a guy named Bill, I just turn and run away. <laughs> That right there was worth the price. I, this, is, this is just one week in my life, right? So. Yes. Well, and then you got to come and hang out with us here, which I'm sure was a highlight yeah, as well. I don't, I don't know if I can have many stories on it. Don deserves a prize. Don yeah. gets a prize. Yay, Don. So thank you again for coming and for your generosity with your time. And ours will not be so complicated. <laughs> And thank you all for investing your time in these classes as well. I heard plan, plan, plan. It's even biblical, and I think that's true. All right.